Sorry, we're giving to the World Evangelism Fund. tonight. Let's all stand in the Lord's praise tonight. Come on. Yeah. Hey. 
you know, these delays, they make you do that. And you were somehow, if you're working in a public job and somehow you were exposed to it, they immediately make you go home, uh, get a test when you can and come back. And so it's a very difficult time we look, we live in because we don't know who's going to be in church from one service to the next. And, uh, and it's just, just uh, wax everything out quite a bit. And so we are uh, believing God for our church, our fellowship. Uh, I want to make uh, another prayer amen tonight for Pastor Greg Mitchell. I'm in charge of our fellowship worldwide. He's in Prescott, Arizona. His father, uh, the founder of our fellowship, Pastor Wayman Mitchell, passed away recently. I uh, just went to the funeral at the end of this week, uh, Thursday. Uh, I left Friday was the funeral, and then Saturday I returned here. So uh, it's been kind of a whirlwind uh, for me as well. But that funeral was a phenomenal celebration of a man's life who has a legacy. Amen. And so we are absolutely believing God for uh, for that church because they need us to pray. They need us to be there for them. Uh, amen. And so also the fellowship worldwide. There are, uh, there are many uh, first generation disciples. These were men that came into the Prescott Church at the very beginning uh, of, of, of the, our movement when the Prescott Church was running just a few people, 30, 40, 50 people. Um, uh, they came in as hippies and now they've been 40 years, four, genera uh, four decades in preaching and uh, maybe five decades and traveling all over the world, pioneering works, thousands and thousands of converts that have given their lives to Christ because of them. And uh, their father, our father, just passed away. And so it's, it's, it's hard that way. Uh, but in, in essence, uh, the fellowship will move on even stronger than ever because that was our promise we made to him. And that was his biggest worry. Uh, amen. Was that the fellowship would be focused on him. He never wanted to focus. He said, this is not a work of man. This is a work of God. He says, amen. He goes, I just try to stay out of the way. Amen. And build a dynamic fellowship. 2,800 churches in 140 countries. And so, praise God. So let's pray for all of that. Pray for all of our Ohio Valley churches. We've got a men's discipleship coming up on October 17th, Saturday morning. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll bring their men They'll be here with us. Let's pray for our upcoming uh, little quick revival Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, the 14th, 15th, and 16th of October with uh, Pastor Roderick Gonzalez, a tremendous uh, man of God. And then spent some time in uh, China as a missionary, uh, uh, really, really having some good meetings. Uh, and so we're believing God for him. How many need a time of refreshing in this mess? That's what I'm. I'm the, that's what the flyer is going to be. It's all about a time of refre refreshing, and that's what uh, that's what I'm going to put out there. Just three quick nights of refreshing, revival, letting God just wash all over us. Amen. And help us to get refocused. Amen. I'm preaching on that. Uh, actually, I'm focused tonight. So, uh, praise God. All right. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, Brother Dustin. We'll open us up. Lift up your hands towards heaven. And let's call upon his name. Hallelujah, we thank you. We need you, God. Hallelujah, tonight. God, have right away and dominion in our lives. God, let the anointing, the power of God, amen, be like rhema, God. Hallelujah, in this place tonight, I pray. Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here tonight, Lord God. We just ask you, Lord, Lord, that you would have your hand on all these prayer requests, Lord God. You would meet all these needs tonight, Father. And I pray that you would bless the word that's going to be brought forth through our pastor tonight, Lord God. Let it touch our hearts and our minds. Let us leave this place better than we came into it this evening, Lord yes. God. And just let us leave with a, with, with a picture of our fellowship, Lord God. Let, it, let us leave, to, leave and, and continue to grow your kingdom. Continue yes. to grow this fellowship, Lord God. And, and just continue on strong in Pastor Wayman Mitchell's image, Lord God. Yes. And just continue to, to win the world for you, Lord God, from this tiny little place in New Philadelphia, Lord God. We just we just ask you, Lord God, that we would, we would get fired up in this place tonight, Lord God. We just give you glory, yes. Lord God, Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Take a moment, turn to somebody next to you, welcome them into the house of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated when you're done. It's great to see all of you here on a Sunday night. 
Praise God. Aaron, I know you have a lot on your hands tonight. I, I pray for you extra strength. Uh, thanks for taking care of mine as well as yours. Uh, praise God. Amen. Hopefully you'll be able to stay in here. Uh, amen. Without uh, too much distraction. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, just one announcement, and that is the revival coming up on the 14th. Uh, amen. You'll have digital flyers tomorrow. We'll post them all over uh, social media. Uh, printed flyers later on in the week. We're going to get them out. I'm doing something different this time. I'm going to make a, a number of uh, full sheet posters uh, that we can go out in the public forums and post them on bulletin boards. And then I'm going to have just a small number of actual flyers to hand out to people since it's really difficult going door to door. Uh, we can do that, but it takes a very long time. And with COVID and all of that, it just gets weird. And so, but we'll try to do a little bit of both. So uh, we'll have that coming on this week so that uh, uh, this Saturday, the 10th, uh, we'll be able to uh, maybe get the whatever remains out. Uh, amen. We're going to uh, just uh, have a great time doing that. Uh, looking forward to men's discipleship as well uh, this month. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, amen. So that's all the announcements we have. Give the Lord praise. Our right, so we come. We're going to take an offering. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. One thing that we have been doing uh, is we have been we've been taking up an offering for world evangelism in honor of Pastor Mitchell, who passed away. His greatest heart, his greatest desire was always for the nations. And we have over 2,000 churches. I don't have that exact number. Somewhere in the 2,200 range or 21 something range of churches all over the world. And his heart was about the missionary field and about doing the will of God. Newsmax magazine once uh, listed him as the top 10 greatest missionary world evangelists in the history of the world. One of the top 10. And uh, it wasn't, in fact, it, it, was, it was us that showed that to Pastor Mitchell. We had not heard it, was, it had happened. Nobody called him. He was just included in a list. Uh, his whole testimony was there. It was, uh, it, it was just amazing. And so I said, did you see that in Newsmax magazine about you? He goes, about me. And so I explained it to him. And uh, that's I did that with another book, by the way. I, I found I was reading. Uh, uh, and as I was reading it, there was a whole two pages on Pastor Raymond Mitchell in this book uh, uh, about, about, you know, uh, the revival he had had. And, uh, and just some of the things that had happened to him because of it. And uh, I had to tell him about that. And this is a humble man, Pastor Mitchell was. So in honor of him, in honor of his life, we're going to take up a world evangelism offering. We've been doing it since last Sunday. Uh, tonight is the last night you get a chance to give. You can give something tonight. And then we're going to send it out tomorrow morning. And so praise God. So we are believing God for that. If you're, uh, if you're on live stream, if you would like to participate, you can go to PH Ohio. PH stands obviously for Potter's House. PHOhio.com. And uh, as you go there, you'll find a button online giving on the top. You can just click on that. There is a drop down box. That World Evangelism is one of the choices. You can choose that. You can give your offering. We will include that in the offering we send to Prescott. Uh, amen. And they will distribute that to our churches. Uh, as they as they see the need, as they, as they see fit. So we are believing God for a blessing. I believe God can take whatever money we send in honor of Pastor Mitchell and multiply it. Because that's what God likes to do. That's how he does it. Amen. We already have a testimony tonight. Somebody said they gave an amount uh, this morning for world evangelism. And then just, believe it or not, same day, Car insurance 
went down the exact same amount. You tell me that is a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences that nail the money, the dollar value to the exact same number on the same day. And you happen to say, ah, we're extended, but we're going to do this. And then God says, that's okay, we'll just take it away from here. We'll budget you, we'll help you. Well, just take it away from your car insurance so you can give it to my, to my church. Come on, somebody. I love that idea. And that happened today already. So let's give us the Lord. We need us to give us, believe God. Uh, amen. It's our regular Sunday night offering. And you can give to uh, the Word of Evangelism offering in, in Pastor Mitchell's honor. Uh, amen. Brother Alex, bless the offering tonight. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for something that you came to see me, God, Father, God. Lord, bless the offering. Lord, multiply this money. Bless and give us love and give. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray. chapter 15. Very simple message tonight. And we'll start in verse 1. I want to preach something that's been on my mind is the ever, um, I mean, let's, let's, where can we start? 2020 is very strange. I saw a meme uh, on Twitter just the other day that had a car driving through his windshield. You can see a cow flying across the road. Just like, like, but there's no tornado. It's just flying like awkward across the road. And the uh, the, the the caption said, uh, "I was going to say something about this, but since it's 2020, I just kept driving." Amen. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it is. It's 2020. Anything can happen. Mm -hmm. We've got riots in the streets, burning and looting of buildings. Come on. Uh, we've got. Uh, all kinds of things. We've got a worldwide pandemic that seems to be making its third appearance. And so uh, it, it's crazy. Uh, we have a, a president that got coronavirus and uh, half the country is cheering. It's, it's insane. It's nasty. It's, it's inhuman. Amen. Amen. But here we are. 
Belief in God, trying to do a work of God, trying to fill a church, but everybody is so distracted by everything around them that coming to church is like the last thing that they do. It's like, well, I, you know, when I get time for that, like after 2020 is done with its craziness and its chaos, then maybe I'll settle down in your church. But no, it's in the midst of the craziness mm -hmm. and the chaos that you need yeah. to settle down in church. Come on, Come on somebody. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Because this church will teach you how to make sense of the chaos. Praise God. So F. Scott Fitzgerald said this, there are only the pursued the pursuing, the busy, and the tired. Wayman Mitchell once said, the world is won by tired men on coffee. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Staying focused on God in today's ever-changing world is not easy. Life, life happens so fast in the 21st century that if your cell phone is 12 months old, it is out of date. In fact, uh, I had somebody mock my phone. Oh, is that an eight? <laughs> and it's like, I'm a tech guy, so I was like, I was, I was like offended. <laughs> and then I was ashamed that I'm carrying the Galaxy 8. Oh, so tomorrow I'll be getting something else. But anyway, <laughs> staying focused on God is difficult today. You may not believe it, but this hectic rush of life we experience isn't unique to our generation. Surprising uh, how many times you've heard the, uh, about the good old days and when life was slower and simpler. Wouldn't it be great to go back? Some, some of you, wouldn't it be great to go back to the 50s when life was just simple, just slower? You know, people walk down the street on a Sunday, Sunday morning, sunny Sunday morning just to walk to church, whole family dressed up, just walk down the street to church. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to go back to that? Well, the above quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald um, uh, sounds like something our parents and grandparents probably didn't experience. That is actually from the book The Great Gatsby by uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, published in 1925. So basically, they were feeling the push of, of the hectic life in the 20s. And you remember, that was when the, uh, the roaring 20s happened. There was all kinds of things began to take place, and America began to come alive. But even in the 20s, people's lives were hurried, distracted, and hectic. Still, I'm fairly convinced that there has never been as many distractions in the life of a person as we have now. And 2020 has illuminated that to unparalleled dimensions by making us stay home during the lockdown. Just two weeks flat and curve. Seven months later, what's happening? Curve never flattened. Should have never stayed home. Kids should have been in school. Yes. Come on. Should be back in school right now. Every mother here said, Amen. <laughs> yes. And so, I'm fairly convinced that there's not nearly as many distractions there wasn't in the 20s or any other generation than there is now. The internet provides millions of options to every scenario. You don't know how to do something? There's 25 competing YouTube videos on how to get it done and get it done right. Right? The internet provides millions of these options to every scenario. Technology expects us to respond in milliseconds. And with that, we accomplish more in a day than the 1920s accomplished in a month. Meanwhile, entertainment is fed to us by the terabyte. You can binge watch an entire season of a show at one time. Every aspect of life is exploited by advertisements and fed to you online, to your phone, to your tablet, to your computer, and even to your watch. You can spend your whole paycheck online shopping and never even leave the couch. Oh, it's true. <laughs> Too much to Chris's chagrin. <laughs> Every task you accomplish can be measured in steps, in heartbeats per minute, in respirations. And the reason we measure such things with our little uh, uh, Fitbit or what have you is because we no longer have to move around to make a living. And so exercise is our saving grace to those who choose to keep moving. So how do we stay focused on God in the modern grind of life while so many things are out there competing for our attention? As I thought about all of this, 
I thought about we need to stay focused. We need to get a hold of God and stay focused. I've got some real quick uh, 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 things that we can do that will help us. Amen. And, and so now that I'm done with my introduction, I'm going to turn on my clock so I, I, I get some free time. Okay, so. Number one, begin the day with God. It sounds simple enough, doesn't it? And it's going to be one of the first suggestions you'll find in any internet search when how to stay focused on God is the search string. But that's for good reason, because it is essential. If you or I are going to stay focused on God, we have got to include the things of God in our daily lives. I know, I know, simple. So simple, we fail to do it. Amen. You've probably heard that when something is repeated twice in the Bible, it's something to pay attention to, right? Yes. Yep. How about something that's repeated ten times in one teaching? Come on. In one chapter? That's how many times Jesus used the word abide or remain in me in John 15, verse 1 through 11. That's he, ten times, he continues to pound in the idea that we are to abide in him, stay in him, keep focused in him, allow, you know, attach our lives to him, remain in him. Let's read through the whole thing for just a moment. John 15, verse 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it so that it can bear even more fruit. You ever been pruned a time or two? Yeah. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides, stays connected to, Amen. Focuses with the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You cannot bear fruit unless you abide in Christ. Yes. I am the vine. Verse 5. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So this message, this sermon couldn't have come at a better time. Because there is a whole lot of competing uh, 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 things trying to take you away from Christ. Yes. To break you apart from him. To keep you apart from Jesus. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You should write that down, underline it. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my, by this my Father will be glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. See, how do we know that you're a disciple of Christ? You're bearing fruit. Yes. If you're not bearing fruit, you're likely not a disciple of Christ. That's what it's saying. And because the proof of you being his disciples is that you bear much fruit. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy uh, may be in you, and that your joy, because of that, because of him abiding in us, us abiding in him, uh, your joy will also be full. That's what that means, verse 11. John 15, 4 lays it out, starts the whole chain of events, abide in me, where he begins to talk about how abiding in him is the most crucial thing you can do. He repeated that in two other ways in verse 5 through 7, while also providing the warning that apart from abiding in him, you can do nothing. Apart from him, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, verse 6, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Because what good is a vine that no longer abides in the, in the trunk? 
What good are a branch that doesn't connect to the tree? It's called a twig. We pick them up and throw them out here for the trash mm -hmm. to pick them up. Mm -hmm. Or we burn them yeah. out of my house. Put them in a little burning, and we burn them. That's just the twigs are useless when they're no longer with the tree. Come on, somebody. Yes. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you will, and it will be done for you. It's amazing that that just, that just comes out. It's just so simple. So awesomely simple. So awesomely simple that we fail to do it. I know. Listen. Stay focused on God. And that requires abiding in Him. I know your mornings are rushed. But you create the discipline. To spend the first minutes of your day praying, reading the Word of God, talking to Him about your day ahead, you will have a greater focus on Him throughout that day. If you leave your home in prayer before the Lord, on your way to work, if you will allow yourself to be free from distractions and, and full of God, your day will be the best day you've had in a very long time. And I know it's difficult sometimes, but we have to focus on him. If you don't know where to start, try reading John 15 that I just read, verse 1 through 11, each morning for an entire week. It won't take long, and the passage is crazy profound, filled with all kinds of tidbits of knowledge, and it just absolutely uh, laid out for you to be blown away by. So that's the first thing, amen? Stay focused means, you know what? Include God in your day. Begin your day with God. Secondly, remain in prayer. Do you want to create and develop the habit of a prayerful life? 1 Thessalonians 5.17 makes one simple yet bold command. It's simple. Pray without ceasing. You don't have to be on your knees. You don't have to be holding beads. You don't have to be doing, you, don't, you know what you need to be doing? You need to be talking to God. I, um, I used to work uh, in, in the pharmacy, I was, uh, and so I'd work in an IV room all night long. And I was the night shift. And I would make IVs for patients, going to laminar flow load and make all kinds of things. And so that's what I did all night. And I want to tell you, I had Christian radio on all night, preaching almost all night long. But when I, when I wasn't listening or I couldn't be there for that, I would be just praying. I would, I would be going through my prayer list as I'm making IVs. I would be praying all night. It was just phenomenal. No distractions whatsoever. It was incredible. And believe me, when the distractions came, when, when some high-risk case came rushed into the ER and they needed something immediately and it had to be rushed and they come running up uh, to, to retrieve the order from me, they're waiting for it while I'm preparing it. I've got eyes on me, people that are tapping their toes. Come on, the patient's dying. Tell you what, you're far more effective when you've been praying all night. When you've been laying holy God. Praise God. Amen. I used to make this one particular IV that immediately uh, went into an intracardial needle and went right into their heart, directly from my hands, from my, under the laminar flow load, all, all in the gown and the mask, and, and I'm underneath there, so all the, the negative uh, uh, airflow uh, keeps the germs out, and I'm putting this thing together, the perfect amount of that, the perfect amount. The whole thing cost about $15,000. I once pulled it out and I gave it to the uh, ER doctor that uh, we had a, 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 an elevator that went straight from the pharmacy where I was doing that right down to the ER where they would give it to the patient. That's how immediate this was needed. And that ER doctor would stand there and watch me and I would put it all together. One day I handed it to him and I go, there's your new Buick, $15,000 worth of drugs right there. I'll tell you what, it sure made a difference when I was prayed up when I was focused on God. Because when you're focused on God, a task like that is easy. Amen. So you can develop this habit. Developing a habit takes between 14 and 28 days. And this is a habit worth developing. It isn't as difficult as you might think. Plus, prayer has a way of changing lives. Amen. So let me give you some suggestions about prayer. Number one, document. Make a prayer list. Have something on your phone 
uh, or, or, or even uh, in paper, if you still use paper and pen, that archaic method of communication. But otherwise, you can put a list out there, make a prayer list, add people to it. Continue to add people. If people say, pray for me, write them down. Have it with you. When you sit down to pray, just read through your list, praying for people. You, you can say things or not say things. You can just say their name before God. Whatever it takes, pray and lay hold of God and focus on your prayer. When you see or hear a news report that bothers you, pray for the people. How many prayed for the president when you found Amen. out he had coronavirus? Instant, instantly. Amen. I know everybody in this building did so. Praise God. Amen. When you hear that, you pray. You pray. And when uh, when you come across something that annoys you or something, uh, a, a news report that bothers you, pray for the people. Pray for the situation. And then something annoys you or tries your patience, find a moment. Turn away. Face the wall. Silently pray for them. Amen. Get a hold of God about the situation. Yeah. When you hear of someone facing some problem, large or small, don't just say, I'll pray for you. Pray for them. Yes, amen. Many times, somebody will call me, they'll be freaking out, and, and, and they'll tell me, so please, keep me in your prayers. I'll say, let's pray right now. Amen. I prayed over the phone and saw people completely healed as if I laid hands on them in a crusade. It's amazing to see what God can do. And you don't have to be a pastor to pray for people. Every one of you are capable of saying, let me pray for you, and then pray. Yes. I don't ask. I just say, let me pray for you right now, and I just start. So they can either listen, pray with me, or hang up. It's up to them. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I'll never forget the time two Mormon men knocked at my door. Arizona, if you're Mormon, and you... You want to go to somebody's house, you probably shouldn't go to mine. Mm -hmm. But they did. I felt at the moment that they were soon to be victims, but I didn't want to tell them. <laughs> Instead, they started talking to me outside my, my door. And so they started telling me about Joseph Smith and about this and about that, and quoting some scriptures, trying to make it sound mainstream. And I said, this is great, this is great. And I grabbed both their hands. I said, let's pray. And I started speaking in tongues. <laughs> I started laying hold of God and started praying. Thank you, Jesus. When I was done, they were looking, they were shell-shocked. They'd been at war. <laughs> They're staring at me like, oh my God, what have we done? And then I said, why don't you come on inside? So they came inside, they sat down in my living room. And for the next hour, I paced back and forth in the front preaching to them about the word of God, about the gospel, about how I grew up reorganized Mormon, and how I got born again, and how I know that all the books I was given as a kid and I read for as a kid are all false, and I'll tell you why, and that's laid it out, talking about the blood of Jesus. Anyway, uh, long story short, soon after that, you would walk into my church in Arizona, Casa Grande, and the front row had six or seven Mormons every Sunday morning until they brought the elder, and then they got them all out of there. But and before then, they were one at a time. They were going and getting their friends and coming to our church. Come on, somebody. And sitting in the front row, hearing the real word of God, because I prayed for them. I grabbed their hands, and I took a spiritual dominion right in their laps. Amen. That's what you do. That's what prayer will do. Amen. That's what prayer will do. I once knew a family that taught their children about staying focused on God by offering up a quick prayer every time they heard the siren of a police car, an ambulance, or a fire truck. Just stop what they're doing. Talk to their kids. Stop what you're doing and just say a prayer for that person. God doesn't need your eloquent, long-winded, pious-sounding discourses laced with these and thous and almighties. God wants your heart. Yes, amen. And often in prayer, that sounds as simple as, God, help me. I, I've actually slid to my knees in this very building before and said, God, you're never going to believe this one. Even though I knew God knew all about it. But I had to, I had to lay it out. I had to get it off my chest. Amen. Number three, limit the distractions. In a blog post entitled Three Ways to Having More Faith, 
I read that we're to keep a clear space between us and God. I thought that was wonderful when you begin to think about what that means. Keep a clear space between us and God. That means allow nothing to stand in your way. No distractions, nothing blocking your view. Keep a clear space between you and God. There should never be anything stepping in between the two of you. You should have a clear space between you and God all day. And this is, of course, nothing to stand in your way spiritually, no distractions spiritually to cloud that distance. You can't keep your eyes on what you can't see physically or spiritually. So you need to be able to see God throughout your day. If something tries to distract you, you need to remove that distraction. Hey, man, in Joshua uh, chapter 3, verse 4, the people of Israel are commanded to keep a distance of 2,000 cubits. Between them and the Ark of the Covenant. That's about half a mile. And the purpose was so that at, so that the people of Israel, as they're walking in a great line of, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, three million? Some say maybe a million, million and a half. Doesn't matter. There's a lot of people walking in line. They were to keep a, two, uh, a half a mile distance between them and the Ark of the Covenant. Because if you're on a mountain or a valley or wherever you're walking, you can always see the Ark when there's a half a mile distance. And it's clear. You can stand above the crowd. And you can see the Ark of the Covenant. That's the picture. And then all through the terrain, the valleys, the mountains that they were traveling through. And in our spiritual lives, when we fill the spaces with all kinds of conveniences and all kinds of distractions, it becomes very difficult. It even becomes impossible sometimes to know, to have any idea where is God leading you. When you're so distracted with everything else that's coming your way, when you're so caught up on entertainment or, or, or freaked out by, by, by the way your life is going or, or completely mired in the chaos. You ever known somebody that's always mired in chaos? And they try to put it on you. Yeah. And you can't, it's like, no, no. I was, uh, I was down in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, preaching for uh, Pastor Morales just last week, and we were having dinner, and family members were there, this little nine-year-old girl, and, and she's, she's funny, really funny, but, but very shy, and so uh, uh, Pastor Morales is her uncle getting in her face, and she, she did this. <laughs> hey, man, it's, it's hilarious. How many distractions, and I don't mean hilarious in a funny way, it, it's ridiculous how many distractions will try to take, uh, try to uh, keep that distance, uh, will try to block that distance, uh, amen, and we fill spaces with all kinds of things, it becomes difficult, we even know where God's taking us, and we can overcome this by limiting the distractions. I said, we can overcome this by limiting our distractions. You are the one that allows these things to distract you. You can absolutely turn aside, choose not to honor anything that tries to take up your time, tries to uh, limit your space, tries to get your mind off God, tries to get you focused on something that doesn't matter. We can overcome this by limiting the distractions, the busyness of our lives, our own lack of discipline, by making a conscious effort to keep our Lord the number one spot in your life. Number four. These are all very simple. This one is just a complete revelation. Are you ready? Don't lay it out. Be careful. Get a pen ready. You need to write this down. You don't want to miss this. Number four. Serve God. Wow. Shocking, Pastor. I don't know how you come up with these things, Pastor Cunningham. This is just amazing. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus teaches no one can serve two masters. Why? Because he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve God and money. And you've heard that verse. You've probably heard the word, the term used, mammon, in place of money. At the end of it, you can't serve God and mammon. Though mammon was a word that primarily represented money and possessions, uh, it also uh, used to refer to uh, lusts and greed of all types. So if you're serving God with your resources of time, energy, talents, 
and with your money as well. And staying focused on God will naturally follow. It's, you know what? It's, I find it's easy to focus on God when you have invested your life in it. I was in the Air Force. We, have, we meet lots of people, especially in our fellowship. Many, many, many veterans in our fellowship. Many pastors, most pastors that I know, have spent some time in the military uh, in our fellowship. And, and, and we, so we go back and forth all the time. Uh, he was a Marine, he was an Army. Uh, his, 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 so, uh, and I always, I always say the Air Force. And they always say, ah, oh, you guys, Air Force, we'd be digging sand to make a place to put our bed outside in the desert in Afghanistan. And you guys were in air-conditioned bunkers. <coughs> Had barracks that were air-conditioned. Uh, even Pastor Nick Hatt from Cincinnati, he goes, I went one time uh, because I needed something, so I went into supply to get it, and there was an airman in front of me in line complaining there was no air conditioning. I was trying to look for a better shovel to dig out my bed. I said, the military invests in what it values. What can I say? <laughs> the more valuable you are to the military, the more money they spend on you. Air Force personnel need air conditioning mm -hmm. to keep healthy and straight and ready. Amen. Why? Because we have to clean up after your butts when you get in trouble and you call for air support. We're the last ones you see before you get home. You get home. Amen. I can say that now because there's nobody in here from the Army or the Marine. <laughs> Otherwise, they'd be yelling at me right now. So, if you're serving God and you're investing in what you value, you hear me? You invest in what you value. Well, I don't have, you know, the money to tithe. Really? Because look at your possessions. Look at the things you bought last week. Right? You bought those things because you valued them. You needed them for one reason. So if you value God, then you're going to invest in God as you invest in other things you value. Amen. If you're serving God with your resources, of time, of energy, of talents, and money, then staying focused on God will naturally follow. Uh, amen. Number five, remove sin from your life. This could have been the first point on the list. Might have gotten, gotten done with it immediately, but I wanted you to remember Amen. What I mean by this is to remove the habitual, continuous, sinful habits and patterns from your life. The things that you have known for a while, the things that you have struggled with for a while, it's time to break the power that those things have over you right now. Yes, sir. Hebrews 12.1 says, since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, or such a cloud of witnesses, the Bible says. We must get rid of everything that slows us down, that so easily besets us, says one translation. Especially sin that distracts us. That's what that means. Amen. If sin distracts us like a weight. And we're running the race of faith. We're trying to get to heaven. We're trying to get as many people there with us as we can. And so we are running that race. We're trying to bear fruit. We're trying to allow our lives to matter. To make a difference. So we are running that race. But sin besets us. It drags us down. It slows us down. It tries to trip us up. It distracts us. Yes. All the martyrs and all those that have gone before us, the Bible says, are watching us run the race. And they're watching the sin that so easily besets us. And if there is something, if there is someone or some place or anything at all in your life that leads you away from God in any way or that keeps you out of prayer, away from fellowship, with other believers or distracts you from reading your Bible, you have only one option. And that is to remove that thing from your life. Staying focused on God or growing in your spiritual prayer or Christian life in any way with any habitual sin in your life is next to impossible. I was a chaplain in a prison and in a prison, almost every inmate smokes. 
And so they said they wanted to be treated like disciples. They wanted to be treated like men of God. They didn't want to be treated like inmates or numbers or, or lesser than a, than a normal church person because they were in prison. And they wanted me to run the church, uh, the, the, the chapel like I would run a church. And so we were building a song service. We were putting it together. We were having revival. We were, we were packing out the place. And we, we, we packed out the chapel. So we moved to visitation. We immediately packed out visitation. And then we went a hundred more than we were supposed to put in there. We have the highest percentage of, of church-going inmates, of, of chapel participating, they call it, inmates of any prison in the country. There were executives from private prisons that traveled from Florida and New York and California uh, to talk with me in this prison to find out what are you doing that's causing this to be so successful. They didn't like my answer, but I told them I treat the men like disciples, not inmates. And what I would do is I'd say, you want to play on the platform? They had talent. They were good singers. They were, you'd be shocked to know. I should go to the prison and get some guitar players for here because they know how to play. Amen. They were good, very good. So I got some donations of about uh, $4,000 worth of electric uh, music equipment came into the prison. We set up a complete and full song service with, with guitars and drums and, and amps and basses and, and, and just uh, keyboards. And it was a phenomenal. And anybody that wanted to play could come and try out. But they had to have a good testimony on the art. Yeah. Meaning I called in other non-Christian inmates and I interviewed them about this person that just applied to be on my song team on the platform. I called them. You want to be on the platform? No smoking. Every inmate smoked. So there's a whole bunch of them. One on a We're Not Smoking Anymore tour. And they started quitting smoking. Finally, we were able to fit together an incredible, incredible uh, song service. I mean, outstanding. One of the one of the young men that led songs was an inmate that had gotten trapped in a couple of different things, got himself in trouble, got arrested, got sentenced to prison. Uh, but at one time, he had been a song leader in a mega church, and he was phenomenal, unbelievable how good he was, and he led songs. And, and one guy was having a hard time quitting smoking. He goes, I try to quit, I try to quit. It's just so hard, you know, there's not much to do here once things close down. And he goes, smoking is just your way to get out of the dorm and just, uh, I don't know what to do. I said, it's simple. I said, the next time that you go outside for smoke, smoke break, go ahead and light it up. And as you're smoking, I want you just to pray like you pray in here, like when I ask you to open in prayer, or when you pray before service uh, uh, in, in the prison. I want you just to start, to keep smoking, but just start praying. Just believe God and just pray with your whole heart. And he tried that, and he couldn't focus, and he couldn't do it. And every time he took a hit on his cigarette, he was convicted. He didn't know what to do. So he put it out so he could finish his praying. And I said, why couldn't you do both? He said it. He said, he, he said to more than one time that you know, it's not going to keep me out of heaven. It's not a really big deal. I don't know why. You know, you guys drink coffee. I smoke cigarettes. The same thing. I said, yeah, I said, yeah, but I can pray while I'm drinking coffee. Amen. He goes, no, I couldn't pray at all. I had to get rid of it. And he quit because he could. He realized it was incompatible with his spiritual life. Yes. And he quit so he could pray. Anybody that smokes, keep that in mind. There's a reason that you can't pray while you're smoking. Come on, somebody. Yes. Amen. Amen. Staying focused on God or growing in your spiritual prayer or Christian life in any way with any habitual sin is next to impossible. Kill the sin or it will kill you spiritually, physically, or both. Kill the sin or it will kill you spiritually, physically, or both. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's been said countless times. When staying focused on God, this becomes especially evident that this is a marathon. I don't care how, how fervently you can serve God uh, for a week or a month. 
Serving God is all the way to heaven. Yes. It's a one-way journey. And the finish line is death or rapture. Amen. So until then, well, how, how long do I have to do this, Pastor? <laughs> until you're ready to go home. Come on. It's a marathon. Hebrews 12.1 tells us that we must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. The next verse tells us how to do that. To focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The source and the goal of where we're going. Amen. So focus on, that's how we do it. Focus on Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. Yes. Sir. And if you'll take these steps that I've outlined for you tonight, and you'll make them daily habits. You'll be shocked at how quickly and deeply your spiritual life will grow. And they will help you when you stay focused on God. And you'll never, ever forget. Once you get these habits securely in your life, you'll never forget how to focus on God. Let's bow our heads. Praise God. They're simple, really, aren't we? There's nothing in here, is it, that you've never heard before. Begin the day with God. Remain in prayer. Limit the distractions. Serve God. Remove sin from your life. All this will be found in John chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. This is how you stay abiding in Him. You implement all of these things in your life. I know, I know, Pastor, these are simple. I've known these for years. Yeah, then do them now. So now we do them. Because <laughs> knowing them and doing them are indeed different things. If you're not saved tonight, you're not born again, you're not right with God, it would be my honor to lead you to Jesus. There's no greater time, no greater opportunity, no better moment than right now to turn your life over to Christ. Whether you're on live stream or here in this church building, you can give your life to Jesus Christ. He died for you. He laid his life down. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, two things. Do you hear God? Can you open the door of your heart to him? As he promises, he will come in and he will sup with us. Supping with us is a forming of a covenant. It's a contract. It will be ratified by our breaking bread together. He says, I will sup with you. He's talking about, I will be your New Testament covenant. And you will be my people. It's a powerful thought. You know that Jesus died for you even without any promise that you would receive him, honor him, or you give him a second look. This world is quite secular. America has become quite secular. And there are groups in America that would like America to be completely separate, separate from uh, secular and, and have nothing to do with God. But America would crash even faster than it is. This right now, 2020, is evidence of America's backsliding. And it is you and me and other Christians throughout the world, throughout the nation, that are keeping America from total judgment. I believe it to be so. We have that chance to continue to believe God together. If you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God, it's time to get your heart right. You raise your hand quickly all over this place. Get your heart right. Before Jesus comes back on live stream. If that's you, if you'd like to get your heart right, I want to pray this prayer with you right now. Just bow your head, close your eyes, and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose from the dead that I could have eternal life. I admit that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. 
And I ask you to come into my heart, to suck with me. Give me the strength, the courage, the ability to serve you from this point forward. I turn my life away from the world and to the cross. To you, Jesus, to be the author and finisher of my faith. Abide in me, Lord, please, as I promise, I will abide in you forever. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This altar is open. Come and find a place to pray. We turn off the live stream to give you some privacy at the altar. Every heart has been somehow touched, somehow changed by this message tonight. You need to get at this altar. You need to find a place to.